My name is uh, Barbara Desrochers. I'm the director of the biotechnology program here. And I'm here to welcome all of you to the Berkeley City College Science Seminar Series. This is our last seminar this fall semester, and we'll start up again in uh, February. The series is sponsored by the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, also known as CIRM. Uh, the biotechnology department at Berkeley City College has received a wonderful grant that allows our biotechnology students, not all of them, but many of them, to have paid internships in research labs. And a lot of those labs are UC Berkeley, UC San Francisco, Children's Hospital, et cetera. And the posters that, they, that are the result of our research are all on the outside that some of you have been looking at. Um, before I go any further, I want to say one important thing. It's we need to turn our cell phones off. So if you can all check your backpacks and make sure cell phones are off. That would be night. Uh, tonight, we are joined by Professor Susan Lynch. Dr. Lynch is the director of Colitis and Crohn's Disease Microbiome Research Corps at the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Lynch's research addresses several aspects of the human microbiome, early life microbiome assembly, relationships between microbiome composition functions and chronic immune activation, development of rationally designed novel micro, microbiome-based therapeutics, and the gut airway axis. So it's with great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Susan Lynch. Thanks, Barbara. It's really a pleasure to be here with you this evening. And thanks to you guys for braving the elements uh, and coming out. I, I didn't expect to see so many faces, I have to say, in the crowd. Uh, and tonight I'm going to talk to you about a very new and emerging and very rapidly evolving field of research called microbiome research. And that essentially is the study of communities of microbes. Um, and it's, it's really an area that we're very excited about. We, we feel it could be transformative for human health and biomedical uh, research. And I want to begin by telling you, as microbiologists, we've come a long way. Uh, back in the 1600s, Antoine von Leeuwenhoek, who developed microscopes, took a sample of his plaque from between his teeth and put it under the microscope he'd just developed and described animalcules, the first microscopic uh, cells or microbes that were described in the literature. So this was the genesis of the, of the field of microbiological research in the 1600s. Fast forward to the 1800s when Theodore Isserich uh, isolated and began to work with Ersertia coli, the workhorse of microbiology and microbiological research. And we've kind of moved along this, this gradient in these years where we've largely, as microbiologists, viewed human-associated microbiology through the lens of single species. We have always worked with single species in isolation until about 10 years ago when we began to acknowledge that there's far more microbial diversity associated with humans than the one or two or handful of species that we had traditionally studied. I will say that we've traditionally tended to study the pathogens. There's a little work on commensal organisms as well, but we've really tended to focus our efforts on pathogens and not consider the context in which these organisms are found in the human body. And we're a little behind the curve in, in the human research, microbiome research circles, because way back in the 1980s, Alan Konopka and several others noticed that if you took a, a milliliter of seawater, the diversity of microorganisms present in that sample, you could never recreate that diversity under lab-based conventional culture conditions. You simply did not see the same diversity of organisms there. And that's because we all know now that conventional culture conditions select for a, a small sliver of organisms that grow best under those temperature and nutritional conditions. And so luminaries in the field, like Norman Pace, went about developing approaches that were culture independent. You didn't have to grow the bug to be able to know it was present in a sample. And, and so they, they really focused on this gene shown as a, a cartoon here, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. 
it's a biomarker gene. It's only found in bacteria. It's not found in fungi or any other higher organisms. And every bacterium has at least one copy of this gene. It's a really wonderful biomarker gene because it has these regions of highly conserved sequence shown here in green that are consistent across all bacteria, or relatively consistent. And they flank these hypervariable regions of sequence. And these are regions of sequence that have evolved at different rates across different bacterial species. And so if you read the sequence of this, these hypervariable regions, you can tell which microorganism, which bacteria it arose from. So this is a wonderful way to understand which bacteria are present in a species without ever having to culture them by virtue of these what we call basically bacterial barcodes. And so what we can do is we can take any kind of sample, we extract DNA from the sample, we use a pair of what we call universal primers to amplify either the full length gene or different parts of this gene that house these hypervariable sequence regions. And then there's a variety of approaches in which we can read what, what are those 16S sequences that are present in a given sample. And from that, we can generate essentially a fingerprint of bacteria present in any given sample, an environmental sample, a human sample. And not only can we tell who's there, we can tell their relative abundance. So for example, if we had 1,000 16S genes that we sequenced, and 900 of them belong to Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we know that 90% of that community is dominated by that organism. So it gives us some information about who's there and their relative distribution within a community. And that's really important for how microorganisms interact with one another. So when we've applied these tools to humans, we found something pretty cool. We're not alone. We are a super organism. We are a conglomerate of human and microbial cells. And we are overtly colonized inside and out by microbes. And what's really astounding is that only 10% of the cells that we house in our body are of human, uh, are, are human derived. 90% of the cells in this superorganisms and superorganism are microbial. And it's even more staggering when we think about how much genetic information those microbes encode. We have about 22,000 genes in our genome. We're a single species. We have anything from a few hundred to several thousand microbial species in the gut alone. And so these organisms each bring their own repertoire of genomic function to this holobiont, to this whole ecosystem. And as a result, 1% of the functional genes in the human body are human. The 99%, the remaining 99% are derived from the microbes that, that are, are symbiotic with us or live on us and in us. And these are, have co-evolved with us. So these microbes are not simply bystanders to, to human function. They contribute critical functions to human health. They metabolize indigestible carbohydrates, so we don't have the enzymes to break down many plant polysaccharides that we consume. Xylanases and the like that are necessary to degrade those plant polysaccharides and extract, extract an energy and nutrition come from the microbes that inhabit our gut. These microbes produce essential vitamins and hormones. They're essential for immunological and physiological function. If you take germ-free mice, that's mice that have been raised in an incubator and have never been colonized by microbes, neither their uh, immune system nor their physiological uh, system uh, develop appropriately. They have abnormalities in their gut. Their gut is shorter. It does not develop appropriately. The only way you can overcome those abnormalities is by introducing commensal organisms to those mice. So again, these co-evolved species that we have developed with um, are necessary for development of this, the, the human system. These organisms are necessary for maintaining immune homeostasis. We know that because there's been some recent data showing that specific clostridial species, for example, can induce the T regulatory cells that are necessary to quench pro-inflammatory responses in the host. So these organisms regulate our immune response. And finally, we've, we've shown in some studies that we uh, published a number of years ago now that these organisms reside in biofilms or communities of organisms encased in protective exopolysaccharide on the surface of mucosal uh, surfaces. So these the soft linings that line the mouth, the nose, the gut. 
And if you deplete those organisms, those communities of organisms with antimicrobials, for example, in the sinuses, the sinuses become more susceptible to infection by organisms that don't normally cause infection. So these microbes that naturally live on the surface of the mucosa in the human body can protect and defend us against pathogens. And we believe this, they do this through a mechanism called uh, competitive exclusion. So they, they interact with one another and they undergo, um, uh, they, they ex express specific uh, products such as bactericins which kill competitor organisms and keep them out of the ecosystem. The other really interesting thing is that it's not like you have one kind of microbiome or community of organisms that is consistent across the whole body. In every site we've examined, we see different distributions of organisms. These colors in these pie charts are the main phyla of bacteria that are found at each site that we've looked at. And the relative amount is how much of each phyla are there. And so you can see, for example, in the gastrointestinal tract where it's an anaerobic environment and very distinct from the surface of the body, there is a three is to one bacteroidetes to firmicute um, ratio, these two key phyla found in the gut. And that's very distinct from what we see in the external auditory canal or on the skin or on the hair. So what we know now is that in this superorganism, there are distinct microecosystems within this macroecosystem. And these groups of organisms and these distributions, we believe, derive the kinds of functions that these organisms engage in at each site. Beyond this, it's a dynamic system. This is a really complex thing to study. And I'll talk a little bit about this first part in a, in a slide later on. But this is not a static system. We develop diversity in early life. Somewhere around the age of between one and three years of age, we kind of reach a steady state with respect to the composition of the microbiome. This has largely been shown in the gut microbiome and not elsewhere across the body, though we suspect the same phenomenon um, are, are present in those sites. As we uh, get older, we start to lose diversity from our communities. So we start to disassemble our microbiomes. And it's not surprising that this occurs during the period of immune maturation in infancy and the period of immune senescence in senior years, that we see the most dynamic changes in the composition of the microbiome. So the other thing we know is that across the globe, we're all very different with respect to our microbiome. There's a wonderful study by Jeff Gordon's group published two years ago where they sampled individuals in the USA, Amerindians in Venezuela, and Malawian populations. And what they could show is that, um, and I should tell you how to read this plot, so each spot is a gut microbiome profile of bacteria in each individual they studied. And the proximity of each spot to any other spot on this, this graph tells you how similar those communities are. Spots that are very close to one another are very similar gut microbial communities. Those that are very distant from one another, there's very distinct bacteria present in those gut microbiomes. And what you can see is the US population, their gut microbiomes are all here together in one part of the plot and distant from those of the developing nation, Malawian and Amerindian populations suggesting that, that ethnic and geographic and dietary divides um, dictate the types of organisms found in these distinct populations. Host genetics as well very likely plays a role, but that it's not consistent across geographic divides uh, across the globe. And so if this seems like way too much to study, there's way too much complexity, don't fear. We have a framework to understand how these ecosystems work. We can stand on the shoulders of giants in the ecology world because they've been studying complex multi-species communities for eons. And the same central tenets and principles that apply to a rainforest or a lake uh, system apply to the human ecosystem and to the microbes that reside within humans. We disperse organisms between each other. And Jeff Gordon has shown that beautifully with family units. So, members of a family unit share very similar gut microbiomes, and they're very distinct from those outside of the family unit. We also know that these communities can be invaded by pathogens, that's well established. And we also know that the mother disperses a microbiome to her child during birth, and this is particularly <laughs> so if the child is born by C-section. C-section, sorry, by vaginal birth. 
vaginally born babies uh, inherit a suite of microbes that are identical to the mother's vaginal microbiome, the types of organisms in the mother's vaginal tract. So this is lactobacillus and sneepia. Children who are born by C-section inherit a very distinct group of organisms, typically dominated by Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, organisms that we find on the skin. So clearly those first interactions with individuals, uh, with, with infants, in the first few um, uh, period, the first earliest periods of life, dictate the types of organisms that colonize the neonatal system. And if we think ecologically, founder species or pioneer species, those first organisms that come into a, a pristine ecosystem, they frequently dictate which other species can co-colonize with them in that, in that uh, niche. And so we think that this is a really critical period uh, that dictates uh, a child's propensity to develop disease, and also in this period as they develop their, their microbiome. And that's been borne out by studies that have shown that babies who are born by C-section have a significantly higher risk of developing allergic disease and childhood obesity. And we believe that there's no firm evidence yet that the foundation for these childhood diseases and perhaps even some adult diseases are laid down in this critical period of microbiological development that occurs over the first year of life. And so we're really, really interested in this very early gut microbiome development in infancy. And we're interested in it from the perspective of childhood allergic asthma. This is a, I'm sure most of you know, uh, because the prevalence has increased quite dramatically over the last several decades. It's a reversible uh, bronchial hyperresponsiveness to common aeroallergens, for example. And what's really struck us as investigators is that the prevalence of this disease is so pronounced in Western nations, the Americas, uh, Australia, and some of the, the westerly European countries that are quite westernized. And so when we think about this, we've really dramatically changed how we interact with our environment in Western nations and how we, we interact with the environmental microbiome in Western nations. And this is a really, I would urge you to try and read this, this, this paper by Graham Rook. I, I really love it. He basically traces human microbiological history. And so uh, he, he notes that as we move from our kind of paleolithic uh, ancestors who are, lived in small groups and were hunter-gatherers, hunter as we went through our first large epidemiological transition to the Neolithic and on through the Iron Age, we were farmers, we domesticated animals, and we didn't really change our interaction with the environment. We still largely lived in rural environments. And we uh, had a lot of interaction with uh, animals, untreated water, um, and feces. It's really after the Industrial Revolution that we have dramatically changed our interaction with the environment. Now the majority of populations, particularly in Western nations, live in cities. We're surrounded by concrete. Um, and we use a lot more detergents, for example, to clean ourselves. Our food is very, very different from that which we consumed even a few decades ago. We have uh, uh, chlorinated water, we have much less animal contact, and we use antibiotics in Western nations with a significantly higher frequency than in uh, less developed uh, nations. So we've really changed our interaction both with environmental organisms and we've really influenced the microbes that live in and on the human body with these, with these dramatic changes. And so that led in the late 1980s to David Strachan uh, proposing what he called the hygiene hypothesis. And this is the idea that the increased prevalence of all these Western associated diseases like allergies and asthma are really due to our disconnect and lack of exposure to commensal organisms which we've developed and evolved with and which are necessary for critical aspects of immunological and physiological development. And when we think about, there's been a lot of epidemiological studies that have really identified risk factors that are drive disease or that are known to be associated with disease development. Um, and these have been confirmed across multiple uh, cohorts in different countries in Western nations. And when I look at this list, 
pretty much every one of those things on that list that are a risk for developing allergic disease has been established to change the gut microbiome of infants or adults. So early life antimicrobial exposure in infancy is known to be a risk factor for developing allergic asthma. And David Relman has shown quite beautifully that healthy adults who are uh, exposed to antimicrobials have this massive and dramatic depletion of diversity of their gut microbiome. Now, the diversity rebounds. These are very resilient communities. And within two to three weeks, the diversity comes back. And the communities look somewhat like they were before the antimicrobial administration, but not always. The rate of community reassembly differs across individuals. And without fail, in every adult that's been examined, every microbiome loses members that are never found again in the gut microbiome following antimicrobial administration. So this really profoundly changes the composition and perhaps the function of these communities. We know that formula feeding in early infancy leads to a loss of commensal bifidobacteriaceae uh, species that are necessary, again, for modulating immune response. As I mentioned, uh, C-section babies start life with a very distinct microbial inoculum, and we believe that that leads to a different type of community developing over the first year of life. Interestingly, if the mom is lacking exposure to animals, either livestock or domesticated animals like cats and dogs, furred dogs, furred pets, that's a risk factor for developing allergic disease in her, in her, ch in her child. And I'm going to come back to this because this is something we're very interested in exploring. The mother's antibiotic use during pregnancy, we know very little about the pregnancy microbiome. There's one paper out there that show, shows in the third trimester, uh, a, pregnant, a healthy pregnant mother's gut microbiome becomes like an obese microbiome, uh, or a microbiome associated with obese individuals. It has this amazing capacity to extract more and more calorific content from the nutrition that's ingested. And we think that this is a natural phenomenon that occurs to support the developing child in utero. But each time the mother receives an antimicrobial during pregnancy, which we assume impacts her gut microbiome, there's an increased risk for disease development in her child. And the more rounds of antimicrobial exposure in pregnancy, the higher the risk becomes. Also, a, a lack of early life furred pet exposure of the child is a risk factor for developing uh, allergic asthma as well. And again, I'll come back to this because this is going to be part of the, the talk later on. But what this tells us is that prenatal and very early life exposures seem to be the consistent risk factors associated with allergic disease development. And so we've been really interested in uh, examining this period of life because it's quite difficult, obviously, to look at, in utero at the, the prenatal stage. There's support for the hypothesis that aberrations in the gut microbiome lead to disease development that come from really wonderful work using culture-based approaches. Just because we have these new technologies doesn't mean that we can't still uh, examine and use culture-based approaches as well to support their, our hypotheses. There was two independent studies, one by John Penders, the other by I Erica Isaluri, that showed that children who had a very high abundance or high numbers of either Clostridium difficile or Sertia coli in their feces at three weeks of age had a significantly increased risk of developing allergic disease. So what that tells us is really back at this stage of life, very, very early life, aberrations or dysbiosis in the gut microbiome are associated with developing allergic disease. So what happens in this period of life? And I alluded to this earlier on. Well, every child is born with some level of diversity. These, this is a study that we have in review. It's 25 children where we studied their gut microbiomes. We collected their stool at birth, one, three, six, nine, and 12 months of age. And this is simply the diversity of the community. How many types of organisms are there and how are they distributed within these communities? So every child inherits or starts life with a, a level of diversity. It ranges hugely across children. Irrespective of what they start with, every child accumulates bacterial diversity over the first year of life. The rate is different in children, but every child accumulates microbes. And when you accumulate microbes, you accumulate their functions. And so this made us think, if you only start life with this much diversity, where do all these other species come from? 
And so in Western nations, we spend an astounding almost 90% of our time indoors in the inbuilt environment. And almost 70% of that time is in our households. And we believe that that's probably even higher for infants who largely are in the inbuilt environment. And so that suggested to us that perhaps this early life microbial diversity that's really critical for accumulation of functions essential to maintain immune uh, homeostasis or develop the immune response and physiological development of the child, that library of microorganisms that inhabits the human gut may actually be coming from the homes of these children. So we came up with a hypothesis, because that's what you do. And we hypothesized, based on everything we know in the literature, that the microbial environment of the household a child is raised in will influence their gut microbiome. And that will influence their immune response and dictate whether or not they develop disease. And so the first question we had was, if this is true, the bookends of this, is the early life house dust microbial exposure uh, of a child related to their propensity to develop allergic, um, allergic disease and asthma or allergic wheeze? And so we had the wonderful fortune to work with Jim Gurn and Bill Bussey in the Inner City Asthma Consortium. This is an NIH-funded study to examine why asthma occurs at a much higher prevalence in uh, socioeconomically depressed inner city populations. And Bill and Jim had this prospective cohort study of full-term infants who were born in inner city neighborhoods across four different cities. And they had the foresight to collect house dust in the first year of the infant's life in the homes they were raised in. And then they followed these children out to three years of age and defined clinically whether they were allergic, whether they had atopy, and whether they were uh, asthmatic or looked like they may become asthmatic, whether they had recurrent wheeze. That's usually the, the, the marker for developing asthma in later life. And so we had house dust and three-year data from about 104 um, homes. And they broke into nice, even numbers. And the children in those homes either neither developed atopy, which we defined as having this uh, antibody IgE against aeroallergens in the circulation above 0.35, or wheeze, and this is defined as a child wheezes. And at least one of the times they wheeze, it has to be when they're three years of age. So the children e either had neither, they were just wheezers, they just were allergic, they had atopy, or they had both atopy and recurrent wheeze. And we asked simply, is there a difference in the microbial exposures of the households of these children? Could their environmental microbiome be influencing their disease? And what we found was, yes, it was. It was quite different. When we develop a profile of bacterial communities, or species in a bacterial community in a given sample, it's a really highly dimensional data set. We might have 900 or 1,000 different bacterial types in the sample. And we want to reduce that down to a summary statistic so we can actually examine differences at the gross level of these communities. And there, these are three of these summary statistics that we typically use. Richness is just simply we count how many different types of microorganisms are in the sample. Evenness, as I alluded to earlier, is how are those organisms distributed? Because we think that that matters for how these organisms interact with one another and, and uh, behave. And then finally, diversity. In this case, we use this index, the Shannon index, which is these two uh, indices rolled into one. And what you can see is we go from the healthy children who do not have atopy or recurrent wheeze through the wheezers, through the atopics, down to the more severe atopic wheezers, we're losing richness. There's far fewer types of microorganisms in the environment of children who develop um, disease compared to those who don't. They're far more uneven communities, meaning that those children that are, um, develop disease are exposed, overexposed to certain organisms and underexposed to others. And there's far less diversity in these communities. And the next thing we did was we looked at the communities themselves. Again, this, these are those plots that I said earlier that the, this is a bacterial community profile in the house dust of one home. This is from another home. And the proximity tells you how similar they are. And what we're looking at here is if we bring your attention to these two plots, the, the microbial community composition of homes where the children were atopic and pink are significantly different from those where the children do not develop disease. The same for the children uh, who do not develop disease versus those who develop both atopy and recurrent wheeze. And so the next thing we asked was, who's different? 
which specific organisms. The really wonderful thing with 16S uh, profiling is we can get to look at organisms that we never knew even existed in the house dust of these children. So we asked, who's different? And the way we read these plots is we just compared the communities of the protected children versus those who developed either wheezing, atopy, or both. If anything's up in this quadrant, it means it's above this line, which is our significance line, means it's significantly enriched in the household of the children who did not develop disease. These other quadrants are things that are significantly enriched in either of these conditions. So we didn't find anything significantly enriched in any of the conditions, in the diseased conditions. We think that maybe fungi are playing a role in these homes, and it's a loss of bacterial species and enrichment of fungi, which we're not profiling here. And we think that that's why we see nothing in those quadrants. Here, we start to see that children who are protected are exposed to about uh, 20 different types of organisms when we compare the neithers to the atopics, and about 80 when we compare the neither to the boats. And so who are these organisms? Well, they belong to a relatively small group of, of, of families of bacteria. And there's a lot, as you would expect, of overlap. So we see Lachnosporaceae, for example. They include those clostridial species that induce the T regulatory cells to dampen immune response. Um, there's also Ruminococcus, again, key immunomodulatory species that we know exist in the human gut. And in fact, when we looked at all 82 bacterial families that are associated with protection, they're all associated with gut microbes. So this, again, led us to think that perhaps the environmental microbiome is influencing the gut microbiome of children and dictating their propensity to develop disease or not. So how do we go about testing or proving that? Well, we had another study where our collaborators had shown back in 2002 that infants who are exposed to furred pets in the first year of life really don't develop allergic asthma. Very, very low rate compared to those who do not have that exposure. So we asked the same question. Does having a furred pet, a dog in the house, or a cat in the house, change the microbial exposure of children who are raised in those households? And so we studied house dust from homes with dogs, cats, or no pets present, which we think of as the bacterial desert. And we asked the same question again. Are there differences? Are there gross differences in the, in the communities of microbes in those homes? And again, we used those three major metrics, richness, the number of types of, of taxa present, uh, the diversity and the evenness of the communities. I put the no pet um, group here in the center of each of these plots. And you can see the no pet uh, homes where the children go on at high frequency to develop allergic asthma are devoid of uh, species richness. They're significantly less species richness, richness compared to homes with dogs present or cats present. They're far less diverse, and they're far less even. And I should say that it's dogs, and to a lesser extent, cats, protect children against allergic disease development. And we see this kind of uh, titration of microbial exposure, bacterial exposure in these homes. And again, I'm not going to give you a list of Latin names that really make uh, no sense to anybody, but I want to summarize and tell you that when we looked at the taxa, the types of organisms that discriminated those different homes, again, the majority of bacteria that were enriched in the protected homes and the dog-owning homes, for example, have been described in the human gut microbiome. So this gave us two lines of evidence suggesting that perhaps environmental exposures influence the gut microbiome in a manner that um, changes immune responses in the airways and that there exists a gut airway axis. And so we went on about proving this using a mouse model. And so we wanted to really recreate what we think a child uh, experiences when raised in a home with dogs or no pets present. So we took house dust from a home with dogs, are no pets in the home, and we fed mice for seven days with these two different kinds of dusts to try and recreate what children do. Children engage in hand-to-mouth activity in, in their environment, and actually it's been shown that they uh, increase that frequency of hand-to-mouth activity when they're inside the home. We think it's instinct. They know they're not getting enough microbes. <laughs> and so after the seven days of supplementation, we start to challenge the airways of the mice with a cockroach allergen. This is a, a traditional model that's been used several times. We do that three times, and during that period, we continue to expose the animals to these different kinds of dust. 
And then we, we uh, sack the animals and we examine their airways and whether they respond to the allergen challenge um, and, and how they look. And I should sh say that the typical response to an allergen is what's called a, a Th2 hyperresponsive reaction. And so this is a subset of immune cells that come in and they express a, a very discrete set of cytokines or chemical signals, um, IL-4 and IL-5. And what we found was that the animals who received the dog-associated house dust had significantly reduced IL-4 and IL, uh, IL-13, here another one of the Th2 cytokines. Um, they also had significantly reduced expression of this gene that's involved in mucin hypersecretion. Again, that's another response to an insult in the airways. And here you can see in the bottom, these are histological slides of the airways of the mice that we studied. This is a set of control mice. These are the air spaces in the lungs, and they look pristine. This is an airspace in, a, in a, another control animal that we simply just exposed to the allergen challenge. This airspace is now filled with pink staining mucin, and there's a ton of nucleated uh, immune responsive cells around this airspace. The same with the animals who received the no pet associated house dust. There's a lot of pink staining mucin, and there's immune response cells. These are the animals that got the dog associated house dust. They look exactly like the control animals who never saw any allergen challenge. So we're able to protect the airways of these animals. But remember, the hypothesis was that this would actually happen through the gut microbiome and changes in those communities. So we profiled the cecal communities of animals who received dog-associated house dust in blue, no pet-associated house dust in red, or control animals who we didn't manipulate. And what you can see is that once we start feeding the animals house dust, we shift the composition of their microbiome. And we shift the composition differently when we feed this no pet house dust compared to feeding this pet associated house, house dust. And so we wanted to know specifically who are the organisms that are enriched when animals are protected against allergen challenge. And so we just compared the types of organisms in those two uh, conditions, protected or unprotected animals. And we found that there was about 100 different types of bacteria that discriminated those two sets of animals. This is just simply a phylogenetic tree of the phyla that those 100 taxa that differentiated the two groups belong to. And you can see that the majority of uh, taxa or types of organisms that were enriched, shown in red, in the protected animals belong to this phylum called the firmicutes, one of the dominant phyla that I told you about at the outset of the talk that are found in the human gut microbiome. Um, the, the length of these bars just tells you the magnitude of how much they're enriched in protected mice. And so you can see there's, there's four here, I have them num numbered, that we're really interested in. Again, the Lachnosporaceae group, remember the group that I showed you were highly enriched in the protected, protective dog-associated households and in the, the households where the children do not go on to develop allergic um, wheezing. Same group turns up here in these protected mice. Same with Peptococciaceae and the Bacilliaceae. And we found a Lactobacilliaceae member that we're really interested in. The one, this taxon is uh, represented by Lactobacillus johnsoni. And we were really interested in this bug because I'm sure any of you that's ever seen a probiotic knows that it's mainly Lactobacillus species that you find in probiotics. But we're really interested in this one because this single species becomes highly enriched in the mother's vaginal tract just before she gives birth to her child. So we were really interested in working with this organism because as I told you, those founder species are really key, we believe, in dictating how the community evolves over the first year of life in infancy. And we believe that this Lactobacillus johnsoni species was an organism that might be a very, very important species to uh, change the composition of the microbiome and elicit changes that are protective to the animals in this case and to humans, we believe, in the natural scenario. So what we did was we went back and we collected uh, the cecal material from the cecal contents from another group of mice that we'd fed more house dust from the dog owning home. We took those cecal contents and we put them on uh, isolation agar specifically to isolate the dominant lactobacillus species in those protected animals. We found hundreds of lactobacillus on the plates. We sequenced them and about 20 of them 
were uh, sequenced. They're 16 S, the full length sequence sequenced. And uh, they were all lactobacillus johnsoni. So our molecular tool for telling us who was enriched and protected animals was very accurate. So we took the lactobacillus johnsoni isolate and we grew up a large batch culture of it. And we made essentially little probiotic supplements for our mice. We went back, we did the same model again where we took the mice and we fed them just the single lactobacillus species and asked the question, if we give one species that's associated with protection, can we protect the airways of those mice? Um, and what we found was, yes, we could. And I wish I could show you the data. It's beautiful, really. Um, what we showed, we have a measure of how reactive the airways are in, in mice and in humans as well. It's called bronchial hyperreactivity. And what we found was that in the mice that we fed the lactobacillus johnsoni to, they had significantly reduced bronchial hyperreactivity shown here. Again, when we looked in the airways at the, the response of the Th2 cells, the allergen responsive cells, we saw that the three cytokines that are key to these, these cell types, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, again, were significantly reduced both at the mRNA, shown here in black bars, and at the protein level, only in the animals that received the lactobacillus johnsoni. And again, the airways, when we look at the histology, this is the control, air spaces are full of mucin, there's lots of immune cells around these air spaces, but not so much when we look at the lactobacillus-fed animals. Though I would say, it's kind of hard to see here, there's a little bit of pink staining there. They're not as pristine as the animals who got the multi-species dog dust inoculum. And so we then went on to ask, is this protection of the airways just exclusive to allergen challenge, or does it extend to other insults that we can uh, expose the airways to? And so we went on to look at a virus called respiratory syncytial virus. It's a really important virus from a, an asthma and allergy perspective because children, all children get this virus by the time they're age two. But children who have a very severe response to this virus in very early childhood and are hospitalized for this upper uh, respiratory infection go on with much significantly higher uh, propensity to develop um, allergic disease and asthma. The other question we had with this experiment was, do you have to have a live lactobacillus johnsoni to protect the animals against RSV, or will a dead one do? Do you have to have a metabolically active species? And what we found is here, again, if we look at bronchial hyperreactivity, it's only the live lactobacillus johnsoni supplementation that protects the animals and reduces, significantly reduces their bronchial hyperreactivity. The same in the airways. The air spaces of the live lactobacillus supplemented animals are significantly improved compared to the controls. And when we go back into the airways and look at, again, the Th2 responses, which are how we respond to RSV infection, IL-4, IL-5, and 13 are again significantly reduced only in the live supplemented mice. The other response we have to this viral infection is from Th17 cells, which characteristically produce this IL-17 cytokine. Again, it's significantly reduced. But the interferon gamma response, and this is a response that allows the host to clear the viral infection, that's not subdued in these mice. So what this tells us is that the mice still have the capacity to clear the viral infection, but they don't mount this adaptive immune response. And it's actually this adaptive immune response that causes all the pathology associated with this viral infection. And that's dampened in the animals who receive the lactobacillus johnsoni supplement. But remember, we think this has been modulated by the gut. So how, how is this happening in the airways if it's the gut that we're changing? So we looked at ant antigen-presenting cells, dendritic cells, in the mesenteric lymph nodes of these animals. So these are the cells that take antigens from the, the, the bacteria in the lumen of the gut and present them to the T cells, and then the T cells proliferate, and there you get large numbers of them. And then we, we think there's a few ways it could happen. We think that some of these dendritic cells and perhaps the T cells translocate to the airways to elicit their effect there, or there's a few other hypotheses we have. Bottom line is what we found was in the mesenteric lymph nodes, which are found right by the gut, we have significantly reduced activation of the dendritic cells. So they're not capable of presenting as much antigen to the T cells, and as a result, we have far fewer T cells and far fewer activated T cells in the gut. 
So this does seem to be indeed being modulated by the gut microbiome and their activities in a manner that quenches immune responses associated with hyperreactivity and pathogenic response to viral infection. We went back and we looked at the cecal contents of those animals that uh, received the Lactobacillus johnsoni because remember I told you we think it's a key founder species and it has the capacity to really shift the composition of the microbiome. And indeed, that's what we found in the mice. These are control animals. These are animals who receive the Lactobacillus johnsoni. And you can see from their distance to one another, they are compositionally very distinct communities in the gut microbiome when you introduce Lactobacillus johnsoni. But what's really critical here is we never found any of those other three species that I pointed out or families that I pointed out that were associated with protection in the animals who received the dog-associated house dust. So what I'm starting to think is that you receive the Lactobacillus johnsoni from your mother if you're born vaginally, and that allows for selection of protective organisms from the local environment of the child that include these organisms that modulate immune responses and downregulate hyperreactivity. And that really it's these environmentally sourced uh, species that are required for full protection of the system from uh, allergic response and viral infection. And so to conclude, what we can say is that really this, we're looking at what I think is a really exciting um, emergence of a host environment interaction that's mediated by the environmental microbiome via the gut microbiome. Local environmental exposures we can show are related to clinical outcomes of disease. And that the gut microbiome can be influenced by the local microbiome in the vicinity uh, that we know these children are raised in who do or do not develop disease. And we've shown, a lot of people have shown that if you knock out the gut microbiome with antibiotics, that you enhance the, the pathogenic response to viral infection and a number of other bacterial infections. And that's wonderful. That tells us that we've got a problem with using too many antimicrobials because it's wiping out the capacity to deal with pathogenic um, organisms. But I think what's very exciting from our perspective is that we have shown that we can protect a mammalian host by manipulating the gut microbiome from both viral and allergen exposures. So what's next? We want to go from what we see as this very diversity depleted and microbially functionally depleted microbiome that we find in disease to restore what really should be there, a highly diverse and highly functional community. And at the moment, our tools are pretty blunt and they're pretty extreme. We have probiotic formulas that really have you know, one or two or a handful of organisms in them, and really they're organisms that are functionally, to my mind, pretty similar. And as I've told you, the lactobacillus species that we find, or maybe I haven't told you, those lactobacillus species are oxytrophic. They need certain microbial partners for them to thrive in the ecosystem. So if you give a probiotic supplement to somebody who has those partners already in their gut microbiome, they'll probably benefit from that supplementation. But you introduce that probiotic supplement into a diversity depleted community that does not harbor those supporting actors, and you will have a very different outcome in those individuals. So we're going towards rationally designing therapeutic communities that have these keystone uh, probiotic species at their core, but that we provide them with the support scaffold that they need for longevity and modulation of the immune response. The other extreme is we have fecal transplant. And that's been used to um, treat recalcitrant Clostridium difficile. So this is Clostridium difficile infection that is not responsive to antimicrobials. And the idea is you take the species of a healthy individual, you make a slurry, you infuse it into the diseased patient, and 90% of those patients get better, go into remission, as opposed to 30% with traditional antimicrobials. So this has made... Uh, a number of people in the field think we're going to use fecal transplant for every disease indication under the sun that has a dysbiotic microbiome. And it's not working for other indications because we don't know what we're trying to treat. And so Clostridium difficile is a very obvious and very key and very well-defined indication, but I think we need to understand how microbes interact with one another and who are the specific organisms we need to oust a pathogenic community. Um, rather than this kind of blunderbuss approach that really is quite unrefined and, and, and um, very variable because you're taking different types of microbiome from different kinds of healthy individuals. <laughs>
And I think ultimately, we need to understand the human microbiome at a systems level. We need to move past describing who's there and understand the functions of these communities and the functions of these communities in each different niche that we are trying to re rehabilitate. Because my suspicion is that you may need a very distinct group of organisms for the sinus, uh, for patients with chronic sinusitis to rehabilitate that niche compared to those that you might need for the gastrointestinal tract. And so we need to understand both composition and function and the specific site and disease indication that we're trying to treat before we can come up with rationally designed consortia of organisms for the treatment of the variety of diseases that um, we, are, we are studying. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge my wonderfully diverse and uh, multi-species uh, ecosystem, my research uh, peeps who are just phenomenal, uh, Homer Boucher and Kei Fujimura at UCSF, with whom, without whom I could not do any of the work that we do in the field of allergy, which is one of the areas of interest of the group. Uh, by the same token, Chris jo uh, Johnson and Dennis Ownby, who've been wonderfully uh, generous in allowing us to access an amazing cohort of infant stool samples paired with house dust samples, where we can start to really look at whether the house dust environmental microbiome populates the infant gut in very early life and, and address some of the questions that we have based on the studies that we've performed to, to date. The Inner City Asthma Consortium, uh, Jim Guerin, Bob Wood, and Bill Bussey in particular, as well as Nick Lukacs and Tina DeMore at the University of Michigan who performed all the mouse studies that I described this evening. And then finally, um, our support from our funding agencies, in particular the NIAID, NHLBI, and NCAM who've been highly supportive of our research program. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. There is one paper that just has come out in October of this year. It's by Andrew Rundle at um, NYU, I believe. And he has shown a, a relationship between antimicrobial exposure, C-section, pretty much all the risk factors that we have for allergy, he's shown a holdout for uh, childhood obesity as well. I can, Rundle, R-U-N-D-L-E. I can let you in a little secret. We're looking at this. And we have very strong evidence that it is a very altered microbiome and the specific functions in the gut microbiome are altered in very early life in children who could then go on to develop childhood obesity. So again, with the idea that we are changing composition, we're changing microbial function, and that the genesis of that, probably some of it is in utero, but we can at least study it from uh, very early neonatal life. And we can see signatures there from very early life uh, that make sense in the context of obesity, but I've given away too much. Yes? Is there any paper or work research done to correlation of these risk factors to autism or mental health? Yeah, I don't know that there's, we suspect, you know, any of those diseases, you can probably correlate back to some of these risk factors that they will be, I won't say universal, but common across multiple um, childhood diseases. I don't know that there's epidemiological evidence for that. Quite frankly, we just haven't done the studies in the epidemiology world. Asthma and allergy has been studied for, for a few decades now because prevalence has been so high. Autism and, and some of those, they really become, come to the forefront only in the last decade or so. So we just don't have the cohorts to make those connections right now or the numbers of children to study. Uh, but my suspicion is that much of this is laid down in very early life and in the, the prenatal period. <coughs> yes? Um, how do you think diet relates to the study, as in antibiotics and meat, pesticides um, that we're exposed to, and uh, genetic modified organisms? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a huge, that's a very broad area. Let me, let me just say, you know, um, Marty Blazer has some beautiful data showing that subclinical concentrations of antimicrobials given to mice leads to obesity and increased adiposicity. And he showed that you know, it, it doesn't take a, a clinically uh, relevant concentration of antimicrobials to perturb that ecosystem in the gut and lead to changes that um, uh, relate to increased uh, calorific content extraction from the same amount of food. So you can put two mice side by side, 
And if you give one of them um, successive treatments with very low concentrations of antimicrobials, they'll eat the same food, but the, the ones that are treated with antimicrobials will uh, increase in size and adiposicity. So pesticides, we don't know yet. We're highly suspicious. Uh, metal exposure in early life has also been, expo uh, been associated with neuro neurodegenerative uh, diseases in adulthood, in fact. And again, we don't know what the link is, but we're suspicious that there's some changes. You know, anything we're exposed to or anything we ingest is potentially a perturbing factor for this ecosystem. And it seems like this ecosystem here dictates what goes on at all the other sites in the body, that there's some link. We think that's especially true for the mucosal system. You know, we've shown the, the gut airway axis. Sarcus mesmanian has shown really beautifully of a gut brain axis in autism spectrum disorder in mice. Uh, there's a model, it's called the MIA model. You infect the mothers while they're pregnant with influenza, and then their, their offspring actually have all of the social and cognitive, um, most of them, issues associated with autism spectrum disorder. And what he's shown is if you feed those animals uh, Bacteroides fragilis, which is a commensal organism in the gut, that you can significantly reduce those, those uh, cognitive and social behavioral issues in mice, in mice. Um, so you know, all of our exposures, we're, we're a conglomerate of all of our exposures, but pretty much anything could, could influence these communities. And we really dramatically change. <laughs> In the Western nations, we, we, I think that the C-section rate in Brazil is close to 90%, elective C-section. And I, you know, C-sections are necessary. There's emergency C-sections that are necessary. Not every child that is, has a C-section goes on to develop disease because there's redundancy in the system. So there may be a C-section baby, but maybe they're breastfed, have dogs in the home, live in a farm. You know, there's redundancy in the system. So it's not a linear uh, relationship. There's, there's multiple factors that dictate our health status, but we believe that diet and antimicrobial use are two of the huge factors in Western nations that are changing our interaction with our microbiome. Yes? Yes, thank you. <coughs> Do, is it believed that the gut sort of primordially provides a congenial environment for the bacteria, or do the bacteria turn the gut into a congenial That's environment? That's a great, great question. There's evidence uh, for both. Uh, there's evidence that the prenatal exposures of the mother set up a landscape, a colonization landscape that accepts certain organisms. So for example, um, in breast milk, there's secretory IgA, uh, tons of it, and that acts as a, a decoy ligand. So it binds to pathogens and takes them out of the system. It does not let them colonize on the mucosal surface. Um, so that is one way, that's just one example of how the, the immune system can dictate or influence who gets to colonize there. I'm a microbiologist and I know that microbiologists are, I call them the master puppeteers. They, what they do best is manipulate their ecosystem for their benefit. And so we know that, for example, um, Salmonella typhimurium, it's an enteric pathogen, um, when it, it becomes infectious in the gut, it uh, derives energy from this very, uh, no other organism does that, that we know about. Uh, thiosulfate uh, provides it with a terminal electron acceptor, so it's, a, it's an energy source essentially, and very few other organisms can do that. So in the context of a highly inflamed gut, where there's a lot of thiosulfate around, it can thrive. Um, and so these bugs, so they, they induce immune responses. We believe the pathogens will induce an immune response to uh, expel the commensal organisms that modulate and downregulate that immune response that keeps them at bay. So yeah, we, it, it's, I, think, I think there's no, no one right answer to that. I think all of these components uh, dictate the colonization landscape in the, in the gut and at other sites. Mm -hmm.